Yeah, you read the title right. I learned to distrust the American media from none other than Ted Koppel. And in this video, I'm going to explain exactly what happened. It was 1992 or 1993. I forget now when the episode aired, but I lived in uh, Greenville, North Carolina. I was teaching as assistant professor at East Carolina University. And one day I got a call from the producer of Nightline. The Nightline, Ted Koppel's 11.30 p.m. ABC news special uh, with, you know, this host, Ted Koppel, who everybody knew, I knew. And this was, you know, Nightline was like my favorite show. And Ted Koppel in my 40s was like my favorite journalist, my favorite TV personality, as opposed to growing up, it was Walter Cronkite. So this was great. And I'm like, oh, they wanted me to come and be interviewed for a new special they were doing on well, the 1987-1988 tanker war between the United States and Iran in the Persian Gulf. And I was flattered that they wanted to talk to me. Why did they want to talk to me? Before I came to East Carolina University in 1991, I had worked for the United States Navy as a historian in Washington, D.C. I did uh, stuff on the U.S. and the Middle East. I actually wrote the official U.S. Navy history of the Navy in the Persian Gulf from the 1830s up until the end of the tanker war in 1988. And then I'd written another book privately on the United States and the Persian Gulf called Guardians of the Gulf, which is still in print. You can find it on Amazon. And I had done other stuff. Uh, during Desert Shield, I had been in the Pentagon working on things related to the, the first Gulf War. And in 1988, during the tanker war, I actually spent a month in the Persian Gulf as a civilian documenting special operations that were going on out there. Uh, I had a, a camera, you know, a, a tape recorder. Uh, and one of my biggest weapons were mailing labels, you know, get people to not throw this stuff away when the operation wound down put it in boxes and I would slap these mailing labels on it and ship it back to Washington for posterity for the historical record. And I was dealing with, you know, the high command out there, uh, special operations, SEALs, uh, Marines, you name it. Uh, there was all, all kinds of stuff going on that I won't go into, but I knew a hell of a lot. I had a top secret clearance, but I knew things that were well above that because people would talk around you without knowing Nobody would ask you what kind of clearance you'd have. They just start talking and you learn all kinds of stuff. And you pretty much knew what you probably shouldn't have known. Uh, I think I had like an hour and a half off the record interview with the intelligence guy out there. And somehow I had been brought to the attention of the Koppel team for this ABC Nightline special on the tanker war. And they wanted to talk to me. So I agreed to drive up on my own, they weren't paying for anything, to Washington, D.C., stayed with a friend and go to wherever their, head, their studios were, I don't even remember now, somewhere in Washington. And that's what I proceeded to do. Well, I got there and the interview began. And I wasn't being interviewed by Ted Koppel, of course. I was interviewed by uh, his producer. And the interview went quite well. I mean, they were asking me things that I knew about. I had been there Actually, I remember that's a shot out out there. I wasn't, you know, before I left, the chief of naval operations, vice chief of naval operations, Admiral Edney, told me, you know, I was going out with a team of two, a naval officer and a naval uh, warrant officer. You know, whatever you do, you don't do this, you don't do that. They told me all the things I wasn't supposed to do. And of course, I was, I was still in my, what was I then? I guess I was, uh, yeah, I was still in my 30s. So I was in you know, pretty good shape. I weighed like 185 pounds and I could still play basketball with the Marines when the temperature was 107. There, there were things I could do then that I wouldn't be able to do now. And so I was, I was interviewing at one point all these small boat guys who went out on the Mark III patrol boats in the Gulf. And, and I was trying to get, you know, what's it like out there? What's it like at night in the dark with Iranians? You can't see anything and there's floating mines and there's all these dangers. He said, you really want to understand it? I said, yeah, 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 tell me. You know, I got the tape recorder running. I said, well, come out with us tonight. We're going out. So I went out with a, the small boat 
team. But then when, when I got to the other barge, which was a Pacific Fleet barge, a Pack Fleet barge, they'd heard I'd going out with the other guys, and they insisted that I go out with them too. So I had to go out a second time. And it was on the first time that we had a, a friendly fire incident. And next thing I know, I've got 40 millimeter tracer rounds like sizzling, you know, past my head. Uh, I think it was Churchill said something like, it's nothing quite as exhilarating as getting shot at and missed. Definitely true. I, I can attest to that. So so I knew a lot. I knew I had been in on the, the briefings in the morning. Actually, that morning I had been in the command briefing. I got all reports from the divisions, CIA. I knew what was going on over Iran. I knew, I knew all the stuff. I knew how they were doing their operations. I knew their techniques and I knew everything else. So I talked about all that. And along the way, they got to a point and he said, well, we want to talk about uh, the Iran Ajar. Let me give you some background on the Iran Ajar. The Iran Ajar was an Iranian smallest ship, Japanese built, that they used to roll mines off the back of the deck into the Persian Gulf. We knew they were dropping mines into the Gulf that uh, tankers would hit. And of course, they denied it at, at the UN. They said it was all American propaganda, you know, death to America, all that crap. But we knew what they were doing. I mean, we really knew what they were doing. I won't go into all the, the details of the various uh, uh, human and technical resources that allowed us to know what the Iranians were up to, but they were able to determine at what point, one point they were coming out on a certain date. I think it was the night of it, September 21st, 1987, about where they would be in the Persian Gulf. And the plan was to lay a string of mines out there. So we decided to ambush them, not just to ambush them in a military sense, but to ambush them diplomatically and politically. We tracked them. When they got to the area and they started laying the mines, we didn't attack. We had very quiet Army Special Operations helicopters overhead taking night sighted video of the operation. So we had them dead to rights. Here was this Iranian ship rolling the mines into the Persian Gulf. We could show it to the UN. We would make claims. They would lie. Then we'd whip it out, show it to the UN and say, here's the video. You know how that works. And then after we were sure we had the video and it looked good and it was clear, then they attacked the ship. All hell, they, let, they used these, what are called sea bats. These were these single man, manned helicopters with the guys had the night vision goggles flying around. They were called sea bats. Little uh, use corporation designed and built helicopters with these rockets. And these things were at night. I've seen them in operation. You... You would, even if it was pitch black with no moon, you would see them. I mean, they would be close before you would hear them. That's how quiet these things were. And they just rocketed the ship. And then I think uh, SEALs went on board, probably lifted down from helicopters and small boats or Zodiacs, boarded the ship, captured it, took it back to a friendly Persian Gulf port, which I won't name. And it's probably known anyway, but I, just to be safe. And, uh, interrogated the crew. Ultimately, they took the ship out into the Persian Gulf. Uh, no, it was the Gulf of Oman, actually, and they sank it. And we took the, I think, the bodies and the survivors to someplace in Oman, and the Iranians came and picked them up, and that was the end of it. And then, of course, we went to the UN. Now, keep in mind, the name of this ship given to it by the Mullahs was the Iran Ajar which is primarily a, a name in, that's, I mean, a rampart, but Arabic. Name of a ship originally, it had been in the Shah's Navy, was a Persian, two Persian words I have trouble even pronouncing. But the, the, I'll, make an, I'll make an effort here. The Persian name of the ship in the Shah's Navy had been the Arya Rakesh or something like that. Pardon my Persian. It's, I, I really don't know what I'm saying here. In any event, it's it's a very Persian name, Arya being from the Aryan, Iran, and, you know, the, the brightness or something. 
And it's interesting because it's basically it's pointed out to be by uh, Ahura Mazda, who's a, somebody I, I know on Twitter, that what they had done with the renaming of that ship, at least, was to take it from basically a Persian name, a Farsi name, to an Arabic name. You know, because they're, they're mullets. They focus more on Islam than on Persianness, whereas the Shah was, whatever his virtues and flaws, at the minimum, a Persian nationalist. Now, in the interview, they started asking me about the operation. And I knew I hadn't been there at that point, but I knew a lot about it. I had interviewed people who had been in on the operation. I knew about the intelligence aspects of it. Uh, I knew people who had boarded that ship. I'd seen the video. I'd seen photographs of them taking the official photographs. Some were released, many weren't, for they were pretty horrific. And I talked about the operation to the extent that I felt I could. I mean, most of the stuff people kind of knew, and they didn't know enough to ask things that I didn't want to talk about because they didn't know either. So that all went fine. But then the producer looks at me and he says, okay, what can you tell us about the second ship? And I'm like, second ship? They're talking about the ship that we use quietly to trail the Iranajar? I'm like, I don't know. I was trying to say, was that not common knowledge? So I wasn't sure I should talk about that. And I said, which second ship are you talking about? And the producer said, the other ship we captured. And I said, other ship? He said, yeah, we captured two ships. I said, not that I know of. I mean, I knew pretty much everything that had gone down there. I knew things that we were doing in and over Iran. I knew things about Saddam Hussein and things about the Iraqis and all kinds of interesting stuff. But I had never run, a court, run across any account or any documentation or anybody talking about us capturing a second ship. I mean, I had interviewed the, the commander of, you know, Admiral Les, Tony Les, his head of intelligence, the deputies. I mean, I, 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 I had talked to at least 70 men. I'd gone out on operations. Nobody ever said anything about a second ship. So I said, I don't know anything about a second ship. If there was one, I think I would have found out. But I said, if I knew about it and I couldn't talk about it, I'd tell you that, but I don't even know about it. I do not have any knowledge of any second ship being captured. So he said, well, there was. And the ship and the crew disappeared. And I go, whoa, what do you mean a ship and a crew disappeared? <laughs> he said, well, that's what we're trying to figure out. What happened to them? So I guess the implication here was we had captured two ships and we killed the crew or captured the crew and had massacred them. I mean, I wasn't quite sure what they were getting at. I said, I don't know. I can't believe. I said, I don't know anything about that. And if it happened, I think I would have heard about it because I heard about just about everything else that was going on. And he said, well, we have, we have, uh, we, we got the story from the flag officer in the Pentagon. So I said, well, get him to tell, to talk on, on camera. He said he can't. You know, he's still serving officer. He's in the Pentagon. He'd be in trouble. And I said, well, well, you know, A, I don't believe there was a second ship. And I said, B, if I knew something about it, I couldn't tell you anyway, if it was that classified, because, you know, I'd be in trouble. If this guy thinks he's going to get in trouble, why do you want me to get in trouble? You know, I think it was five years. You still had to be watch what you said, especially with the clearance I had a higher clearance. It would, it would be the rest of your life. So I said, no, you know, I, I, I just don't know anything about that. He said, look, let me explain this to you. He has told us on good authority that there was a second ship. It disappeared along with the crew. We just need you to say that on camera and then we can move along. So I said, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, the other thing I knew working for the Navy, I mean, there's flag officers and flag officers. You have the unrestricted line. These are the officers who command stuff. And then you have the restricted line officers who really don't command anything outside of their own little restricted areas. You know, medical doctors, dentists, 
psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, uh, supply officers. I mean, this could be some you know rear admiral supply officer in the Pentagon who orders toilet paper for Middle East force, for all I know. I don't know who he is or what he knows or how privy he is to everything that's going on over there operationally. I mean, when I got back to Washington and Pentagon, I knew more about what was going on over there than some of the people, you know, who were flag officers. I mean, just because they were flag officers didn't mean they knew everything that was going on in every corner of the planet, because the Navy is in every corner of the planet. So I was just not impressed. And I said, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that. I will tell you what I can tell you that I know happened. If I don't know it happened, I'm not gonna talk about it. I'm not gonna say that I know this because I'm lying. And the guy looked at me, and this, this was the critical moment for me in the interview. And it, the, it really set the bells and whistles and alarms going off in my head. He looked at me and he said, you want to be on Nightline, don't you? And I thought, you know, JFC, you know, they think I'm going to lie on camera and say something that's, if it's true, is like super duper classified that could get me in trouble just so I can be on Nightline. Yeah, I want to be on Nightline. It's like my favorite news show but I'm not going to sit here and lie to get on Nightline. And then the second bell went off. I can't believe I'm the first person they did this to. How many other people have sat in this chair and told them what they wanted to hear to get their face on Nightline? I mean, this was a big deal. I'm living in Greenville, North Carolina. I'm an assistant professor at, at, you know, in a fourth tier university. To have, you know, Mike Palmer from East Carolina University is on Nightline tonight. You know, this is, this is a big, a biggie. It's big league, but I'm not going to lie. And I told him, no, I said, I'm not going to say something. I know something that I don't know just to get on Nightline. And I started you know, like moving in the chair like I was going to get up. And he said, hold on, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, just sit there. So he left the room. And I don't know if he talked to Ted Koppel. I don't know who he was talking to, but he was gone for a while. And eventually he comes back and he sits in the chair. He says, all right, just forget that. Let's finish the interview. And he went on and, and I was on the show. They didn't cut me out or anything. And I got on there. There were a couple of clips I was in and they, they put my name up. The dean was upset. It didn't say East Carolina University. It just said Naval Story. So he was upset because he wanted to you know, be able to brag about the university. And uh, you know, they, they didn't do a hatchet job with my interview. They, they cut it sensibly. They didn't take anything you know, cut it up to make it look I was saying something that I hadn't said, which was something I was worried about. But they did not do that. I mean, just make that clear. They did not do any out of context crap with the actual interview. But without going through all the details, they got hammered for that show. They were attacked right and left. Why were they attacked? And it has to do with the Iran Ajar who they got. They got some bozo to come on and basically say the things that they had wanted me to say. He was some sort of, you know, uh, defense intellectual. Later on, I, I would see him like on CNN, CNN and MSNBC during the Gulf War as some, you know, expert. The problem was it was bogus. And if they had actually told me what they knew or they thought they knew, I could have told them in a second. What had happened when we captured the Iran Ajar? That was the name that it used, was using at the time. This was, Khomeini was still alive uh, at that point. This was the new Iranian Navy of the Islamic Republic. But on the back of a ship, as is usually the case in navies, you put like the name of the ship. You look at the you know, USS Iowa on the back of the stern where it curves, it will say I-O-W-A or the Missouri or the Farragut or the Decatur or the, the uh, uh, Roosevelt, the Ford, you know, whatever it is, it's on the back of the ship. And the Iranians did the same. They never overpainted the old name from the Shah's Navy, which is the other name. When the people who captured the ship and were in on the capture all knew it was the Iran Ajar because that's 
the intelligence sources that were coming in without going into detail would have used the nomenclature of the name of the ship that the Iranians at the time were using, which was Iranajar. So anybody who was in on that operation knew it was the Iranajar. When the ship got back to wherever it went, when they interrogated and examined, interrogated crew examined the ship, some of those people, all they knew was a ship that on the back had this other name on it. So in their reports, they had used the other name. And I had seen this and I knew about this. So basically, when the reports back went back to Washington, the reports from the operators had Iran Ajar, the reports from the bean counters. And but the bean counters, when they sent their reports back, they had the other name on most of the things. So my speculation is this rear admiral was one of the bean counters. Now the Iran Ajar was in the news. Everybody knew we had captured Iran Ajar. So he's got this capture of a second ship that has a different name. So he must have jumped to the conclusion there were two ships. And since we repatriated the crew from the Iran Ajar, but there was no documentation or no reports, news reports of us repatriating the crew from the second ship, the Arya Rakash, he concluded, I guess he jumped to the conclusion we had massacred them. You know, or, or I don't know, sealed them in the ship and sank it in the Gulf of Oman and they all were buried with the ship somewhere. Now, had Koppel's producer said to me, well, there's the Iran Ajar and there's the Ayar Rakash, I would have immediately said, no, it's the same ship. It had two different names. You know, it was one name on the back. It was the other name that the Iranians were using at the time. I could have explained the whole thing, but they wouldn't give me that information. Oh, it was hush, hush. Uh, th this is super secret. And the Admiral told us, you know, we're not allowed to tell you that. We just need to, you to confirm the outlines, which I could and which I wouldn't without knowing it. And it turned out, thank God I did. Didn't, because otherwise I would have been talking about something that never happened. I would look like, like an effing moron. So, of course, they were immediately attacked. The Navy Department came out and said, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. There wasn't two ships. It was one ship with two names. This is just confusion. And, you, you, they, and basically what they had done, I guess, was to try to spin this whole thing, uh, you know, as, as sort of an attack on the Reagan administration. And here's this guy who's, to me, one of the most respected television journalists, you know, in my mind. And he's running this show where they're trying to get people to lie on camera about things that are wrong. I mean, basically, that episode which actually had a lot of good parts in it and information people didn't know, some of which had come from me that I thought I could talk about, this became junked. It was, it was fake news because they had undermined the entire show by screwing up with the Iran Ajar episode. And to me, this was just, you know, I had to sit back and think. But, you know, this, this wasn't little time. This is big time. This is Nightline. This is Ted Koppel. And they had put out basically fake news. And they had tried to get me to report fake news, to lie on camera, just to get my face on Nightline. Which I'm, you know, I was happy to see my face on Nightline when it finally aired. But not to the extent that I would lie to get on there. But, you know, the guy who they ultimately replaced me with, you know, he made a career out of uh, being uh, one of these lefty defense intellectuals who were well-sourced, uh, you know, with, with uh, the Defense Department, Pentagon, you know, so well-sourced that he basically had lied on TV. Uh, but that's, I think, when, in my mind, the media which had been going down, like took, it was like we went over the big drop on the roller coaster and it, and it just plunged. And, and nothing happened after that. And, and, and this is, you know, the early 90s. This is more than 20 years ago. It's like more than 25 years ago, almost 30 years ago that this happened to me. You know, I didn't use the term fake news back then, but that's basically what I realized. Not every episode, I'm sure, of Nightline was fake news, but some were. I knew people would lie to get on TV. If you needed somebody, which is what they needed, they needed some stooge to come on 
and repeat this information on camera as fact because they couldn't get their source to come on. But I, I think that was, that was really a grim day for me intellectually to understand, you know, a, a simple concept. You know, I guess in my mind, what my brain's telling me is, Michael, if you can't trust Ted Koppel, if you can't trust Nightline, who in the hell in the American media can you trust? And I think right then, my answer was nobody. You know, given that experience, other experiences, I could do another video just on the first Gulf War, but I won't. Not, not right now, anyway. Maybe I'll, if there's a lot of interest in this, maybe I'll do one on that too, because there's a lot of stuff I saw there too. But I mean, that was really, I guess, when I lost my faith in the media. So when we look at what's going on today with this election and the media and the American media, or what's been going on over the last four years with the American media, you know, the whole idea that, you know, Trump and his supporters about, about fake news. You know, I was there almost 30 years ago. And I often wonder, every anytime I watch these shows, whether it's 60 Minutes or when Nightline was still on, 2020, any of those sort of news magazine shows, and I see these people, you know, spilling the beans about X, Y, or Z. You know, I always wonder, are they being honest? Or are they just saying what they've been told to say by the producer? Because if they don't, you know, you want to be on 2020, don't you? You want to be on 60 Minutes, don't you? We need you to say this. Because that's happened to me twice in my career. Like I said, once locally in Greenville, North Carolina, with the CBS affiliate there. Or maybe it was the ABC affiliate. It was one of the affiliates there. It doesn't really matter which one. And so what? It's a local affiliate. But, you know, Nightline, ABC News, Ted Koppel. That was really bad. And that's how and why Ted Koppel taught me personally to distrust the American media. What do you think about this video? Uh, leave a comment. Want more uh, Defense Department media stories? I've got a few. Uh, let me know in a comment. Uh, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. And until the next time, just remember, keep fighting.